Alrighty, so a good proportion of you made it back. Um, it's getting later on a Friday afternoon, but thanks for coming along. Um, so we want to talk a bit about binary variants. You know, I've talked to them, I've talked about these already in sort of the high level, but we're going to talk about all the different types of variants you can produce for a particular component. Um, so yeah, the idea is that you produce multiple binaries for one component. So that's why we have linkage. We consider linkage a variant because we consider a library to be a single component. Um, we have this concept of variant dimensions, which is how we can vary, how, you know, how can, you know, what sort of ways do the binaries differ for a particular component? So we have linkage as one of those things, static and shared we've talked about. Um, the build type of a variant says, oh, is this a debug or a lease? You know, it's this sort of concept of things that are, have not, that are functionally equivalent but have non-functional differences. Do they have sim debug symbols? Do they have, you know, are they optimized? Stuff like that. We have the concept of a dimension which is the platform, the runtime that this, that this binary should run on. So in the native space, that's pretty vital because, you know, you can't take a 32-bit executable and run it on a 64-bit platform sometimes, or vice versa. You can't, it doesn't always work, so you need to be able to target a particular platform. And then we have this concept of a flavor, which is really kind of this sort of generic um, dimension that lets you, that it, we don't have, we don't attach any underlying meaning to, and you can use it to vary in, in some sort of custom way that makes sense to your project. So like, let's say you develop a free and a paid version of your app, like they, you can configure those things as two flavors. Um, yeah, when you, to simplify things, what we've got is, with those variant dimensions are always there. There's always, something always has a build type. It always has a platform. But if, if when you're building, you only build for one particular build type, we kind of hide that from, from you. So when you're, so when you looked at the executables we built, we've just got a hello executable. We don't know what build type it is because we've been building, just to simplify things because we don't want to pollute the namespace with a bunch of, a bunch of different um, single dimension, single valued dimensions. So by default, because there's only one, there's only one value for each dimension by default, and that means that we usually only produce one variant. Actually, that's not tr quite true. For a library, we produce a static and a shared. For an executable, we produce just one. That's by default, but the whole point of the next bit is to start defining more. So the first build type, the first variant dimension we want to talk about is build type. So it's a really common thing to define in um, in the native space is to basically just say I wanted to build a debug and a release variant. So that's sort of the example we can talk about. But you can add any number of custom build types. So you can say, oh, I want to run a, I have a debug build type. I have some sort of debug build type that has some level of optimization. I have a release build type that has some level of debug symbols in it. I have a full release build type with optimized for size. You can do define whatever build types you want there. Um, by default, you're just going to get a single one called debug. So that's the, that's the default value when you, if you don't define any. So this is how you define build types. So it's a pretty simple DSL. It comes within a model block. So the model block basically defines um, this is part of the domain model for the native space. And we've got a build, a build types container here. And we're adding three build types, debug, debug optimized, and release. So, that's the that's the um, the standard way of defining build defining a set of build types. So, at the moment, you still you need to tell Gradle what each build type means. So there's no there's actually no inherent um, configuration attached to a particular build type. This is sort of a temporary state while we ex develop this feature. Long term, we want Gradle to know. I know how to build a debug release for Linux on GCC, yeah, I know the flags to use, but for now, Gradle provides the, the concept of a build type, but you, tr you provide the meaning of what build types mean in your project. And usually what you do is take this out, put in a plugin that applies to all of your projects so that build types are consistent across all your binaries. So here what we're doing is we're basically saying, we're defining a rule that tells us how to, how to compile debug and release variants. So we're saying, for every binary, we've got just a, if the build types are debug, then define the debug macro, the slash zi args, and slash debug linker args. And otherwise, we can define a no, a no debug macro. So basically, whatever you want to put in there, if you, you could basically switch them around. Like you, could, like you can define however you, whatever, add whatever meaning you want, but sort of a standard sort of thing. 
for a, this is a Visual C++ um, style of a configuration there. Unlike build type, Gradle actually has a built-in knowledge of a platform. It knows what platforms mean, or at least it knows what architecture. So uh, every platform is defined as a combination of an architecture and an operating system. And the, the built-in tool chains in Gradle understand those things and know how to apply the correct compiler flags and linker flags to build for those platforms. Um, in the future, we want to make this uh, even more sophisticated, but for now it works pretty well for the built-in platforms and it's possible to configure cross-compilers for other platforms as well. So um, basically, instead of, instead of you providing a binaries.all block that says this is how to build for that platform, Gradle's just going to find the tool chain that can target the platform and then it's basically going to tell the tool chain build for this particular platform and the tool chain know, takes care of the rest of the stuff. At some point, we'll probably make Toolchain know about build type as well. So then we can, Gradle can just say, can you build a debug variant for this platform? And the build Toolchain will say, yep, sure, and I know how to do it. And then your, and your build script will no longer need to configure that stuff. So defining platforms, similar to defining build types in your build, in your project, but a little bit more sophisticated because you can define an operating system and an architecture. So, in this case, we've defined four different platforms. So we've got a model block. That's just saying this is I'm adding something to my model. Within the model block, there's a platforms container, and you're adding some platforms to that. So you're defining a Win32 platform and specifying what the architecture and operating system is. A Win64 platform, specifying again specifying the architecture and operating system. A Spark platform, and in this case, we're only specifying the architecture, and we're assuming that. But if we leave, by leaving out the operating system value, we're assuming the current operating system or the default operating system of the actual tool chain. And similarly here for Linux, we're saying we want to build for Linux, but just use the default architecture of the tool chain. Um, so while you don't have to do this sort of thing, like I said, the tool chain knows how to configure, configure um, knows how to configure your binaries, knows the right compiler arguments to build, to build for a particular platform, you can do the same thing we did with build types. So basically saying, if the target platform of this binary is Win32, then add some extra stuff. So some, if, if the tool chain's not quite smart enough for you, you can add a bunch of configuration here. So there was a question uh, before about um, cross compiling, so this is the this is the syntax for cross compile for for configuring a cross compiler for GCC. So what we're saying here is we've got a GCC toolchain, and this GCC toolchain actually targets the i386 platform with some extra extra arguments. So let's say you've got a specific version of GCC and it needs to be run with specific arguments. You can basically say when I'm building for that platform, use these uh, you know grab the arguments and add another argument to it. I don't want to go into too much in detail of this, like if you need to learn how to use this, you're probably going to have to experiment a bit or ask around, but um, the functionality is there to configure the tool chain to build for other platforms or to build differently for an existing platform. I don't, no, I don't think so. No, this is, this is I, I added a, updated this for 2.0 and then, but we're not using 2.0, so. So let's not, don't, please don't try this out because it probably won't work. <laughs> but it's, it's the sort of thing that you're going to see in the future. Um, again, this is the same, this is the same uh, similar sort of functionality where we're basically saying, uh, given a GCC tool chain built for ARM, I'm going to specify the actual executables to use for the C compiler and the linker. So I don't want to use the defaults, I want to use something specific. So that allows you to, do, to configure cross-compilers that have different, different executable names. So I mentioned this earlier, flavor is the third dimension we want to talk about, for third variant dimension. And it, just, it actually has no inherent meaning. Basically, you can specify whatever set of flavors you like, we don't really mind. Um, Gradle doesn't, doesn't basically just will say, okay, cool, you want three different variants, and it's up to you to build a rule that says, they ver this is how they vary. They vary. Here's the configuration for them. So you can see it's almost identical to platform and build type. Basically, build a rule, check for the flavor that you want to configure, and Bob's your uncle. 
So I'll move on straight away to what we call a variant, well, no, what I call anyway, the variant explosion. So basically, as soon as you have a, like three things on each dimension, you're getting you're ending up with a lot of a lot of uh, names. Like you're ending up with lots of tasks, and you sort of wish you didn't have so many there. So you start thinking, how can I avoid having so many tasks here? How can I avoid configuring so many different tasks? You know, how can I avoid having so many domain objects being built? And we're sort of started down this path. We haven't gone long. We haven't gone a long way down, but there is ways to sort of say. It's it, the idea is we, we want to have ways to build a uh, to build convenience tasks that let you build a particular subset of the of the variants. So or convenience tasks that let you um, install every executable on this machine, things like that. So I want to talk a little bit about that because the because of this um. This explosion, we need to add convenience. We generally, when they get too many, we need to be add add conveniences. And so, there's a couple of techniques we can use for that. So the, so the first thing is that every um every variant bi every binary variant domain object implements a buildable model element interface. And because of that, it has that lifecycle task that I talked about. It has an associated task with the same name, and it can have other tasks that are involved in its construction. So, but, but as well as that, it can, you, can set, you can say, this buildable model element is actually not buildable in the current build. So you can set a, an attribute on that to say, no, it's not buildable. That means, you, you can, that means Gradle won't try to build it by default. It will, it'll fail if you try to build it. And you can use that in wiring up a bunch of tasks. So we'll use that in a sec. Um, yeah, so the examples of buildable model elements are native binaries, as well as source sets. So language source sets are all buildable, which we use for doing things like IDL. So if you have an IDL source set, or if you have a C source set generated from IDL, then you can use that. Uh, you can have a task that generates the source sets. It's quite quite nice because it's a little bit harder to do that in the Java space and the native space. Having these buildable model, model elements makes it really easy to do generated sources. So if a, bi a binary basically is considered buildable, like it's able to be built if we have a, a tool chain that can target the platform for that binary and that tool chain is actually available on the current platform. So, um, so, there's, so basically if you think about it, we've got, if we're trying to build a Windows variant and we're on a Mac machine with GTC, we probably can't build that Windows variant. So we say that that variant is therefore not buildable. And you can basically do, the, you can configure this yourself. You can say, on top of that built-in rule of try to build everything with, that has an available platform and available platform that can be built, we can say, actually, no, right now we don't want to build the debug. We only want to build the debug variants. So we can sort of do a rule that says, I can specify a project property that says, for every build, to, build binary that doesn't have a debug build type, Say it's not buildable. So we can just, it's kind of a little bit of a, a brute force way of sort of clean, of reducing the number of this variant explosion by just saying, okay, right now, although on my machine right now I could build 400 different variants, I actually only want to consider 10 of them to be buildable. So we have a way of saying, just turn the rest of them off. Turn, turn the rest of these binaries off. It'll automatically not be buildable if it isn't available. That's right, yeah. So. So the, the, it's basically it has to both have, it, it has to both, it'll be false if, if um, it, it has to both have an available tool chain for the target platform and have this not be set to false and it'll, to be built. So this is the, well, I was just mentioning, you know, adding some sort of convenience tasks. So basically saying, I want to, I want to have a task to say, build all of my release executables. So I, I say basically, so for every binary that's an executable binary, and if its build type is release, then say my task depends on that executable binary. Because executable binary is a type of buildable model element, you can just depend on it by, from another task. So it actually can just be added into the task. When a task depends on it, it effectively means the task depends on its lifecycle task, so it gets added into the task execution graph. Um, you can do the same sort of thing. So, so we've got an example here. We're compiling um, every, all the library C++ sources. So we can basically say, I only want to build. Um, so this, this basically depends on every binary. 
so every binary has a tasks container, and you can say, give me all the C++ compile tasks. Probably not so useful, like this one I can see very, being very useful, build all my release executables. And same, build all my shared libraries, very similar to this, a different syntax, we're saying, depend on all the shared library binaries, so all the binaries with type shared library binary that match the buildable, that have the buildable flag. So, so basically in this case we're saying build, build everything, in this case we're saying only build the buildable ones. So, right, okay. So, they're not <laughs> <laughs> so you need a build non-buildable <laughs> task. <laughs> All right. What one trick I found in work is if you have the task depend on itself. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> That's kind of tragic, isn't it? All right. Cool. Let's move on to, to uh, languages. It's getting, uh, it's Friday afternoon. I wish beer was coming in about now, that would be good. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so language support. So we haven't talked about any other languages except C++ so far, but um, I mentioned early that we do have support for C, uh, Windows resources, Assembler, a few other, Objective-C, Objective-C++. So um, there's not very much new to learn to use these different, different languages because they're just it's effectively just adding new, um, it's the same pattern as C++ with different plugins applied. So if we want to grab C, for example, instead of the CPP plugin, we're applying the C plugin. Instead of it being a CPP language source set, it's a C language source set. And instead of the, the convention being so, um, like functional source set name slash CPP, it's functional source set name slash C. So there's not really too much, more, too much to learn there. The pattern's exactly the same. If you want to add a new source set of type C, you've got, you, you've got a, a, a source. This, this, val, this uh, type C source set is a, it is a Gradle type that represents all sources of type C, and you can configure it in the same way you did with C++. Yep? I was just wondering if you guys have any plans for like .NET or C-sharp? Um, not soon, no. We've, we've talked about it in the past, and there's been some interest, but there's nothing on our near radar. We get asked occasionally and it's something like it's certainly not certainly not something we won't do, but it's certainly not something we have on our on our plate right now. So yeah. It's not the first word. Yeah. <laughs> and it the the problem is it probably wouldn't fit into this native into it'd probably be a separate domain again because because .NET is a separate is a different enough env environment, the tool chains are different enough and the way it works is probably different enough that it might be a, done quite done sort of as a sibling to native and Java you know, and .NET, I think would be probably the way we'd look at it. So, won't labour on this too much, but assembler is pretty much identical as, again, instead of, instead of having, the source set name is assembler, ASM, and the default location is ASM as well. So, but just like when we had C and C++, we can add assembler sources. And we can specify, so everywhere else where we've been specifying defines and args, we've been specifying on the CPP compiler. So you can specify a different set of arguments for the C compiler so, and the assembler as well. So the C compiler you can, has the same AP interface as the CPP compiler. You can specify defined macros and specify arguments. And the assembler has it, only has arguments. It doesn't have, we don't support the assembler pre-process, pre-processing at the moment. So the final thing I want to talk about today is um, external libraries. So was there a question? No. Okay. Uh, is external libraries. So in the Java domain, we get pretty, we've been pretty spoilt by having really sophisticated dependency resolution. You know, we have published, we have um, external repositories that contain all the artifacts we want and we can, you know, they're publicly available. And we have all sorts of tooling that lets us sync, you know, lets us have mirrors of those internally and we have different clients that allow us to to go up and fetch the right things and resolve big dependency graphs. Um, yeah, it's really, and Gradle ha has pretty sophisticated support for that stuff. And it's pretty amazing to think, like, I, I, I wouldn't want to be a, a Java developer used to that and have to move into the native domain. Because it just, this, this stuff just doesn't exist there, it seems. Like there's no, you know, that maybe within organizations they have some sort of custom way of doing it, but sharing libraries outside of, like, between teams is hard enough and, and between organizations seems virtually impossible. So it's something we really want to tackle is dependency resolution in the native space. So it needs to be able to handle binary variant compatibility. So we need to be able to say, I'm building a debug 
variant, I need a debug, I need a debug version of all the things I depend on. Or I'm building a release, that's, at least if I'm building a release variant, I definitely need a release variant of all the things I depend on. I'm building for x86 on Windows, I, that's what I, you, you know, I need to grab those sort of variants. There's probably some compatibility, to, some, some variants might be able to satisfy a, a couple of platforms and we need to be able to handle that sort of thing. So, but we haven't, and so, so the idea is that this is what we're going to be working on quite a lot in the next six months. Uh, but, um, for, and, and as well, it's not like we already have a few metadata formats we'd like to be able to support. So there are some repositories of binary software out there that we'd like to be able to support. It's just that there's no, doesn't seem to be a good way to, to resolve them from within a build file. So um, the current support for dependency resolution is, is pretty limited outside. So we have what you've seen already where your executable can depend on a library that's built within the same build, same multi-project build, and it can depend on other libraries. And then we have this limited support for external dependencies, which we call pre-built libraries. So it's basically a library that's not built within your project. Um, and effectively, what you're doing is you're, you, with a pre-built library, you define a repository of, of uh, libraries, and you give Gradle all the information it needs in order to use those libraries in, its, in the build. So you say, tell Gradle where the header files are, tell Gradle what, what files should be used to link against, and tell, tell Gradle where the runtime files are. So then, and then Gradle can do it. So if you do, it's not. So it's kind of a, a possible solution. It's not a really. There's not a really elegant solution, but it's starting us down that path of having um, dependency resolution in the native space. So yeah, the pre, with pre-built libraries, we assume that these headers and binaries exist already on the file system. So they can either be in some sort of directory that you've gotten out of source control. They can be pointing to locations that are well-known locations on a machine for system libraries. They can probably point inside the Windows SDK if you wanted to include those sort of things. So um, basically you configure a repository of pre-built libraries. And the idea is that you'd configure, say, the Windows SDK in a, in a, um, in a plugin that would then, you could then share. And then, so anyone who's using your software who wants to be able to reference things within the Windows SDK can. And some, some guys I know actually generate the pre-built libraries. They actually iterate over every library within the Windows SDK and generate a set of pre-built libraries for that. So it's a, it's a way of handling this sort of stuff with, without Gradle having this built-in knowledge, but it gives you the power to do it yourself. So the downside is that basically this is all explicitly configured by you. It, you can still do it programmatically. You've got Groovy, you've got access to the file system, you can work this stuff out, but Gradle doesn't give you this out of the box. It's something you need to add. So basically, this is a, uh, an example, and you can see it's not, it's, there's a bit of text involved, and you know, there's a bit of code involved to adding a single, well, this is actually a couple of libraries. So what have we got here? Once again, we have our trusty model block saying we're adding something to the model. It's basically, for those guys who went to Adam's talk this morning, he talked a lot about how we're moving into a new, like the, the future of Gradle, and this lets us differentiate the new model rules based configuration approach from other from existing configuration approaches. Um, within that we've got a repositories container that's defined by Gradle. So we've got it, we always have this repositories container and you can add any number of repositories to it and the only type of repository you can currently add is a pre-built libraries repository. So we made this a polymorphic container because the idea is we can add different types of repositories in the future and handle them in different ways. So in this case we've said We've got a pre-built libraries repository called libs, and we're defining a template library. And for a template library, the only thing we need to define is the source directories. We don't need to define, we don't need to define anything else because we're only going to use it as a template library. Um, so we're only going to link, link to that via, as an API, not as a, we don't need anything at runtime. Um, for a Windows library, we're saying here's our headers. And then we use our fam a familiar syntax to define the file, to, to configure the binary, the effective binary for that, for that, um, for that library. So we're saying, if I'm, request, if, a, if I'm asked for a shared library binary, then the shared library file is, uh, is this particular file. It's, you know, it's relative to my project, it's in bin. I've actually, I'm actually building a binary file name out of the build type of this thing, so we can actually dynamically construct these things. So basically, this, this, if I'm requested a debug build type, I'm going to look for mylib-v.1.o slash debug, and then I'm going to look in for a DLL with that name. 
And then we need a link file as well as a li as well as a library file. So in in Windows on Unix you just have, or on Mac you just have a single dilib, and you wouldn't worry about that because you can link and run. You can use that at link time and runtime. On Windows you need a stub to link against, and then a DLL for runtime. So does that make sense? It's a little. It, it, what, so so effectively, if you think about it. Gradle's going to ask this pre this uh, first is going to ask this libs prebuilt library this uh, yeah this libs repository do you have a thing called my windows library yep cool okay if you have a thing called my windows library give me a share give me a, a variant like this give me a variant with that's shared and has a debug build type for this platform and then this rule lets us define the path to the files that w that will that will meet that requirement so, so you're being asked for a particular variant, and this will this will give this this lets you define how to how to map that to the file system. So yeah, as I said, this is sort of this is pretty. Oh, yep. No, I haven't thought about it, no. So it, there's probably there's lots of things. So oh, sorry, the question was on Unix. There's some libraries that support. They will make. So, so there, there will be Right, so so they're self, they're kind of self. Right, but they would sell, They basically could describe where you would find the. You, we could we could run that if we found a library like that. We could possibly run that command and generate and automatically work this stuff out. And I guess you could write a bit of Gradle, a bit of Groovy code to look for that particular command and call it and then configure this because so this is all but the, the, the downside of this is it's very programmatic like it's the this is, I mean it gives you lots of power but it's not declarative in any way this is a programmatic API so so I guess that's it's nice because you can do stuff but we haven't we're like I, I guess we haven't even considered that would be a high on our list of priorities higher on our list of priorities just understanding system libraries and where they are and how they're laid out things like that so yeah, things we want to do is basically one thing would be really nice is basically have a, like like in Gradle you have file system you might have a local repository and it has a layout a standard layout. It'd be really nice to, for us to have provide a standard layout that says look have a directory structure similar to how we would produce the binaries. Actually make that so you can have a have a, a file system layout that works like that. And, you know so the so the the so it's say. When, like library name slash debug slash build type slash platform slash something and then have so then we could and then we could use patterns to match things stuff like that um, yeah so so something along these lines would be really nice to be able to say don't configure every single library but just give us a nice pattern to find them on and we'll and we'll find them that way um, yeah it also be really nice to configure the the prebuilt library for different toolchain variants because because um when you're producing it so it, it's we haven't we haven't quite map, mapped our to our platforms for this dependency resolution where you actually need a particular ABI for, to compile against. And so that's another that's something we need to add to our platform and then actually make dependency resolution aware of those things. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so I guess the I guess the question is, is there a, like why are we like. It doesn't make sense to just understand version names. We need to understand the uh, the versioning scheme that sta the standard versioning schemes for shared libraries on right, right, yeah. So, so yes, we we yeah we want to add, we want to start understanding both Windows like the Windows SDKs and things like that, and also the Linux standard standard layouts and things like that. So, yeah. So yeah. Maybe this is there's a reason why this hasn't been standardized. Hasn't you no know, no one's approached this in the past, but we game anyway. That's about it for today. Um, there's just a couple of things we didn't cover. Um, the C unit integration, it's probably C unit integration. So basically, like J unit for but for C, but for C, um, the IDL support. We didn't cover Visual Studio project generation, and. Um, Adding tasks to workflows, so basically adding extra adding extra tasks into the dependency graph, into the task graph af after the fact. Um, we just didn't have time to do that stuff. Stuff that we're going to start looking at in the future. We talked about earlier the need for pub public and private headers. 
That's something that we just don't model well enough just yet. Um, support for system libraries or installed libraries or whatever you want to call them. So things that are available on the operating system before and much, much more. So any more, any questions before we finish up today? Yep. For the pre-built binaries would it, or libraries, would it make sense to put those on bin tray in the time frame? <coughs> so the question is, is it worth, would it be worthwhile putting the pre-built libraries on bin tray? Um, I probably, we're, like I'd rather work on this and do it properly. Like, it, I mean, you're welcome to try something out like that, but um, like sharing, sharing these, finding a way to share these things could be very useful. Um, but we, I guess, we're working more on doing doing this, like actually changing the dependency resolution engine to to handle these things as well, because the dependency resolution engine doesn't handle static, doesn't handle the the variants very well just yet. So. Yeah, we well, I mean, we're we're very close. Yeah, we're very close. So the question is, um, is do we have we talked to the guys from Artifactory or um, Maven Central about this? Yeah, we're really close with the guys from Artifactory. We where we work really closely together with them on on developing this. You know, um, new meta. It's probably going to require a new metadata format. It's probably going to require a bunch more. You know, some sophisticated interaction with those servers to make it efficient. So yeah, there's definitely. It's not something we're going to do in isolation, that's for sure. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there any contact? Uh, we have, to my knowledge, we have made no contact with the NAR Maven plugin folks. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with it at all. So, try to stick away from Maven when possible. So, <laughs> any more questions? Right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for coming along, and thanks so much for coming to the Gradle Summit too. It's been it's been fun.